بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Welcome to today's episode which is the need for and the miracle of revelation The Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are we going to be discussing in the next set of episodes? We're going to be discussing why we need revelation, the necessity of revelation. We're going to defi- define what a miracle is according to Islamic thought. And we're going to give some examples of the miracles of the Quran, such as the linguistic and literary miracle of the Quran, the historical miracle of the Quran, and the fact that the Quran is multi-layered and multi-leveled that addresses Different levels of understanding and different civilizations, different thoughts throughout time. And that's the uniqueness of the Quran and many other different things, inshallah. So, let's discuss the need for revelation. Why on earth do we need revelation? Surely maybe this God that exists is uncreated, created, that's all-powerful, knowing, unique, one, transcendent. Maybe, and just maybe, he's like an absentee landlord. He just uh, gave us the keys. And run away. <laughs> Maybe that's the case. Maybe we should believe in deism that there is a God, but He didn't announce Himself to mankind. I think this is counterintuitive. What is the intuitive position? What makes sense internally within our hearts and minds? Rather, with our hearts and minds, the other way around, yeah? <laughs> what makes sense is that actually He sent us a revelation, He, he announced Himself to mankind. And just think about the following analogy. If we attribute perfection to ourselves for example we think it's more perfect to when we create an ipad inside the box we have a manual on how to use the ipad and that's a sense of perfection we don't want to delude people and deceive people by just giving them something and not teaching them how to use it properly now if we attribute perfection to that kind of thing that we actually give people a way a set of information and instructions to use something properly then why aren't we attributing attributing that to the uncreated creator? Are we saying the uncreated creator is less perfect than ourselves? Something to think about, isn't it? Because, you know, take an iPhone or a Blackberry or any type of smartphone as an example, when we make it inside the box, there is a manual and a set of instructions. But someone may claim, well, there is a problem here because I know how to use the phone without the instructions. Maybe, but you're always going to fall into error. And you're going to learn by trial and error. So therefore there'll be error. And not just this, you're never going to completely use all the functionality of the phone. So in order for us to completely use the functionality of our lives and our human bodies and souls and to really not fall into error all the time, then we need some kind of set of instructions. And also if you think about it, take animals for example. We believe animals are created just like anything else. And animals, they navigate through existence and life via their instincts. And this kind of amazing cycle that goes on. But when it comes to human beings, there's a problem. If we were to rely on our instincts, there would be calamity, facade, fitna and chaos. Do you see the point? It contrasts this with the animal kingdom. Things work in an ecosystem cycle if they just rely on their instincts. But us, if we relied on our instincts, that's it. There'll probably not be no humanity left. And what's interesting is... Just for example, take this room as an example. Say there was just 10 people in this room, no doors, no windows, and they had to live here for the rest of their lives. And they had just a basket full of bread. If they just relied on their instincts, they'd all be dead, they'll eat each other. But they'd have to have a system and a model. Who shares the bread out? How much of the bread do we give each day? Right? What do we do when someone steals bread? What mechanisms do we have to prevent people from stealing bread in the first place? Do young people, old people get different amounts of bread? What about pregnant women? What about babies? Do you see the point? Even just talking about 10 people in a room with loaves of bread, you could just imagine if we just rely on our instincts, we'll kill each other. So it just shows that, you know, human beings are the only beings or animals, if you like, that I would describe as cosmic orphans. Because we ask why. A cow doesn't really ask why. 
it just navigates life through life using its instincts it finds grass it chews it for long periods of time and he just has a nice time and he just gives us this amazing white fluid called milk right and that's what happens but the human being is a cosmic orphan he asks why and surely revelation makes sense because it's the answer to the why it's the answer to what am i doing here where am i going where did i come from it's the answer to why is there suffering and evil in the world it's an answer to all of these key questions we have. Maybe it makes sense that there is revelation. Now you may now argue, well, it doesn't prove revelation. It doesn't prove the need for revelation. Fair enough. We're not using these arguments as proof that ne revelation is necessary. But it opens that spiritual and intellectual window to think about revelation. And that's the point here. Is it plausible that the uncreated creator actually sent down guidance to humanity and i would argue if there is guidance it's not going to be internal it's going to be external what do i mean by this well internal is that we just judge within ourselves our internal human emotions perspectives and desires and we find out and we assume what god is if we did that there'll be six billion different versions of god right because we all have different dna biology upbringing cognitive development ideas knowledge education cultures and we'll be disagreeing who God is and what God is saying, right? It is no wonder in the history of religion, since 6,000 BC Sumeria, we've had around 3,800 different names for God. <laughs> God knows how many names we've had for the divine reality. So from that perspective, brothers and sisters and friends, we can't rely on just our internal intuition and just our internal speculation. So therefore, to solve the problem on who God is and if he announced himself to mankind, that revelation must be external. It's like a knocking on a door. We weren't expecting anybody. So how do we know who's behind the door? It has to tell us. We say, who is it? And it'll be like, me, it's me, John. Right? So it has to give us that information. So it makes sense that if a revelation does exist, it can't be internal, has to be external. And that makes sense in the form of a book. So it's so rational that revelation has to be external. Now, there are some criteria for revelation. There's some rational principles criteria to assess whether revelation is from this uncreated creator or not. And let me discuss this criteria for you. Criterion number one. It must have the correct concept of God. Obviously. Because remember what we've been discussing so far. That there must be an uncreated creator that is transcendent, distinct and disjoint from the universe. Outside of the universe. If I create a table, I don't become the table. It must be one, eternal, etc. Now if... A particular revelation says, well, actually God lives on a mountain in the universe somewhere in India. He has 12 arms, tattoos and loads of earrings. And his name is, I don't know, Fufula or something. Yeah. Are you going to believe that book? I don't have to read the rest of the book. I just have to know the concept of God that they have. And that concept of the God goes against fundamental, irrefutable, non-negotiable, rational principles, which is God's outside of the universe, mate. He's distinct and disjoint. He's transcendent. Do you see? So... It has to have a correct concept of God. And that's very important. The second criterion is it must be internally and externally consistent. What do we mean by internally and externally consistent? Well, let's take the internal part. Internally consistent means that what it says on page one has to agree on what it says on page 100. If it says on page one, God is one, but yet on page 100 it says God is three, we have a problem. If it contradicts itself internally, it means there are the two authors or the author is confused, and that means it can't be from God. So take externally consistent. Externally consistent means it can't go against established reality. This doesn't mean scientific fact, by the way. Revelation can go against scientific fact, because scientific facts are not 100% true. When you study the philosophy of science, you know science changes over time, because it relies heavily on a thinking process called induction. What is induction? Induction is taking limited observations of the past and concluding for the future and this is limited it's probabilistic it's never 100 percent true because you may have a future observation that contradicts your previous limited observations so induction is not 100 percent true so when they say scientific fact and you could talk to any academic scientist who would say fact with a small f not with a big f it changes over time based on future observations and many different other things so we're not saying for it to be externally consistent it has to agree with scientific facts 
We're saying for it to be externally consistent, it has to agree with established reality. What's established reality? Well, it's irrefutable things like there are trees on planet Earth. If a book says there are no trees on planet Earth, then we are confused. We have issues. If this book says that there are no females on planet Earth, then we have even further problems. Do you see what I'm trying to say here? So it has to be externally consistent. It has to go... It can't go against established reality from that perspective. So that's the internally and externally consistent. The third criterion is it must contain miracles. In other words, there must be some signs that indicate to the supernatural, that indicate that it's from this uncreated creator. It can't just make a claim without any evidence. That would be blind faith. That would be wrong. That would be inconsistent with the human reality because human beings when they make claims they require some kind of evidence brothers and sisters and friends so this is why it needs to have some type of miracle and when you take these three criteria and you apply it to any known revelation the only revelation that comes out shining is guess what al furqan the criterion the differentiator which is the quran the recital, the book, the eternal word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these three criterion, just to repeat, are number one, must have a correct concept of God. Number two, must be internally and externally consistent. And number three, it must contain miracles. And we're going to discuss what a miracle is and what these miracles are, what these miracles are in the next episodes, inshaAllah.